Thank you for being here bright and early. Uh, so welcome everyone, I am Mike McGee. I am the current president of GTFF, although that doesn't mean much being in a room with many, many other former presidents. I feel like I'm in Mount Rushmore uh, <laughs> with everyone else here. Uh, so we have a really great uh, set of panels and speakers today. In case you didn't know, this is to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the signing of our very first contract, which was today, which is really exciting. So let's round of applause for that. Uh, with that, I will now uh, pass the mic over to Bill Rattery, the first lead negotiator on our very first union contract to lead our first panel. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. And um, uh, we'll move quickly through the introductions. Uh, so for those who don't know me, I'm, uh, I, I was a graduate student in community service and public affairs, vice president of the GTFF, as Mike said, chief spokesperson on the team that negotiated and signed the first collective bargaining agreement, which uh, took place on campus uh, 40 years ago today. Um, then after that, I left uh, to take up a professional career at the International Labor Organization in Geneva. Uh, doing writing and other work on international labor standards, uh, anti-apartheid program in, South, in Southern Africa, and especially good practices for teachers, graduate employees, and faculty, and other education staff around the world. And that's what I did for the last uh, almost 25 years before I retired. I, I now live uh, in Jacques, France, uh, with uh, my wife Lee, who is here, who was one of the original GTFFs also. And uh, we split time also between France and Walport, Oregon, and uh, doing some uh, occasional work still on international, cons on international consulting work on education and uh, teachers in particular. Uh, on our panel, we have Jerry Lemke, the first person uh, to my left. He's one of the historic figures in the GTFF, one of its co-founders in 1975-76. So we are situating this 40th anniversary around the contract, but we are, of course, going to step back in time a little bit uh, to the founding in uh, 1975 and 1976. He was the first co-president, later recording secretary, GTFF delegate to the Lane County Labor Council and to the Oregon Federation of Teachers, uh, the precursor to AFT Oregon, he, including the first GTFF leader, to be a state organization vice president, if I'm not wrong. He has a PhD in sociology from the U of O. He had a teaching and research career as a professor and author of award-winning books on international woodworkers in the Northwest, culture, media, reconstructions, and the Vietnam War, uh, in which he experienced firsthand, by the way, and more recently, post-traumatic stress disorder. He is now retired as associate professor emeritus of anthropology and sociology from the College of Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. And he will share with us some thoughts on the GTFF founding, of which he, his unpublished version uh, of the history of the first years inspired uh, a, a part of the event, uh, the history that's in your event booklet. Um, fourth down the line uh, on the panel is Steve Johnson, also one of the founding members and one of uh, negotiating committee members in 1977-78 for that first contract, the historic first contract that we are celebrating. He was also an OFT delegate. Uh, he has a PhD in sociology also from U of O. Uh, Steve worked in survey research for more than 30 years as principal investigator or project director for more than 150 surveys with national, public, and private entities, including states and local governments, universities, foundations, for-profit businesses, and nonprofits. He has conducted original research and published more than 40 peer-reviewed papers on survey methodology and served as director uh, or president of survey research research organizations in student, including Steve Johnson Research Associates. And he will share with us some experiences, um, in particular as negotiator, uh, as, as a member of that negotiating team for the first contract and what it meant subsequently. Uh, to, uh, uh, at the end of our table there um, is Jeff Edmondson, uh, psychology GTF and um, MA um, Masters from the U of O, Vice President, Chief Negotiator, as Mike said, for the GTFF's second contract, first paid staff organizer uh, in the years 1977 to 80. After leaving the U of O, Jeff served as President of the AFT Teacher Classified Union in Portland, taught in public uh, schools in Portland, 
and engaged in teacher education, working notably with UO Professor Chet Bowers to develop the field of eco-justice education, and finished his 30-plus public service career with teacher education program at the U of O, focusing on social and ju social justice issues. Since retirement in 2015, he has engaged in writing and volunteer teaching. Jeff will share his impressions of what the G first GTFF contracts meant for GTFs in the 1970s and where they led us. Um, Olivia Clark, our sole female uh, panelist, uh, who uh, just to bring up the intellectual level just a bit. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, uh, we have, uh, was a department representative and steward, uh, negotiating team observer, and Lane County Labor Council delegate in the years 77 to 79. Olivia gave up an academic career after the U of O in favor of one as local and statewide organizer on rural affordable housing, including farm worker and Native American housing, and advocate at the state and federal levels. She worked in intergovernmental affairs at local and state at uh, local and state government level and as government relations and policy advisor to Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber during his term as governor. She retired as executive director of public affairs for the Transportation Authority TriMet in Portland. She lives in Portland and serves on the Oregon Providence Board. Olivia uh, will share uh, with us some views from the uni union's founding and early years from a sort of grassroots perspective uh, as a union activist and observing those uh, famous uh, negotiating sessions uh, during the years when the, it wasn't as easy uh, as uh, you know, GTFs have it now. And maybe you don't think you have it easy, but it was, it was considerably tough. Uh, to her left is Harry Humphreys, one of the GTF's founding members, uh, grievance committee and negotiating team member in the years 1975 to 80. He has a PhD in sociology also. You know, this is heavily weighted to sociology, but that's okay. We'll, 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 uh, we'll hopefully balance that out a little bit later. Uh, Harry taught for 38 years, uh, of which 30 years at Pittsburgh State University in Kansas. He was twice a Fulbright, Fulbright Scholar to Russia, served three, three times as the NEA Union President for Pittsburgh State University, and on numerous negotiating teams uh, and grievance committees and was engaged in lawsuits that successfully challenged attacks on faculty intellectual property rights uh, before the Kansas Supreme Court, uh, one of the earliest uh, uh, defenses of that uh, in the nation and maybe even in the world. Harry will talk to us about the GTFF as a formative influence on academic and union careers from the perspective of a longtime academic union activist. Last and certainly not least, uh, second from the right, second from the end, is Bob Ginsburg. He's the former president and bargaining team member of the Wisconsin Teaching Assistance Association, uh, TAA, in the years 75 to 78. And he played a very special role uh, with his colleague David Newby, who uh, was also a TAA member uh, and now is president emeritus of the Wisconsin AFL-CIO. Uh, who since his very pr profound regrets because he was expecting to be here, but again, as, uh, due to a, a sudden change in uh, his situation uh, health-wise, he's unable to join us today. He sends his regrets, and um, those two played a special role uh, to help us win the recognition election in 1977, which was really the first... Uh, concrete uh, uh, anchoring of the GTFF on campus. It had existed for uh, almost two years or a year and a half at, at least. Uh, Jerry will tell, tell us about that, but that recognition in election, as the history shows you or summarizes a bit in your booklet, was a very historic and, and important uh, founding step of the GTFF. Uh, and Bob and David came and helped us with uh, that election and uh, provided crucial support. Um, since earning a PhD in chemistry from Wisconsin-Madison, Bob has taught courses, given lectures, done research on transport, urban planning, and environmental health at universities throughout the country, worked on environmental health and uh, justice issues, and pioneered the use of environmental and public health issues in campaigns with major American trade unions. I won't list them all. He's focused on economic development and preserving manufacturing and skilled jobs in urban areas with transit unions, steel workers, SEIU. He has advised state governments, worked as an administrator and policy advisor, 
uh, in Chicago and Cook County and served as a policy advisor and campaign issue researcher with SEIU, SEIU in Illinois, and most recently as senior policy advisor to the newly elected, as of Tuesday, uh, Democratic Party can- congressman representing Illinois' fourth congr- congressional district. He is currently the director of the Center on Work and Community Development in Chicago. And Bob will share with us uh, some thoughts on labor solidarity among graduate employees in the 1970s and what the GTFF and TA experiences meant to him and uh, us and American politics, in fact. Now, um, uh, it's uh, I've said what I think these folks will share with us, but of course they, they may have other things to do so. We've asked each of them to try and hold their comments to five minutes. Uh, the moderator will be very difficult, uh, beginning about the sixth or seventh or eighth minute, if anybody goes over time, because we do want to leave some time for discussion, questions and answers. Uh, and I think we might also have some time f- to come back to that if we need it at the end of the second panel. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jerry and the rest of the panelists. All right. Um, my mission uh, assignment from Bill was uh, focusing on the organizational principles and challenges of, of the early years. And so I want to talk about a couple of things that are in that excellent unpublished version of the first couple of years of, of the union and, and uh, still looking for a publisher, by the way. So <laughs> anybody interested? Um, one of the first uh, uh, decisions that we had, one of the first challenges, and I think most important, was uh, who to affiliate with. Uh, just before we started uh, organizing, uh, AFSME had had a, a campaign for classified workers on the campus. And uh, it was a hard-fought uh, campaign, and they lost. And when they lost, they left town, they closed the office, <laughs> um, they left nothing behind. Uh, they left uh, no organizational uh, infrastructure behind. Uh, they built no leadership. They did, however, reach out to GTFFs and wonder, asked if we were interested in being organized by AFSME. And um, based on what we knew they had done with the classified staff, we said, no thanks. And here, here's the principle on that. Um, AFSME was going to organize us from the outside, all right? AFSME was not going to facilitate even our own organizing. We would have no union charter. Uh, we would have no office. We would have, we would have nothing. It would all be AFSME. And that would set us up, as, as it did the classified workers, for the outside agitator um, uh, uh, campaign uh, propaganda by the administration that the union was an outside power, a third party uh, to the congenial administrative um, employee relationships on campus. And we knew that if we bought into that, we were gonna be in big trouble. Now, so uh, AFT uh, through OFT, the state affiliate, um, quite different. They immediately offered us a charter, um, even though we had not won representation yet. Um, um, I'm not even sure we had had an election <laughs> yet, but they offered us a charter and and we took it. So we immediately we had our we had our own office, we had our own phone number, <laughs> we had our own bank account. Um, the or, we were organizing us, right? Not no, no AFT OFT did not send anybody in from the outside to organize us, and the principle there. It, of course, is good organizing happens from the inside out, right? It has to be indigenous. It has to be from the ground, from the ground up, from the grassroots. The second challenge um, that we had, though, at the same time, simultaneous with that, um, was that um, AFT was generally uh, seen to be one of the most conservative, even reactionary unions in the country at the time, and <laughs> they were really bad on, on foreign policy things. More about that later if you're interested. Um, and they were really, really bad on race. And they had filed an amicus brief uh, in defense of Alan Bakke, uh, who had sued 
the University of California Davis campus when he was refused admission to the medical school there. He had sued on grounds of reverse discrimination, and AFT backed his, backed his, his lawsuit. So this was kind of a dilemma uh, for us. Uh, we had people on campus who thought we should not affiliate with AFT uh, for reasons of, of race. Um, and then we had people who uh, had this organizing you know, priority and thinking if we're gonna union, if we're really gonna do this, right, we're gonna, we're gonna have to, uh, we should go with, with AFT. And so there were, there were real divisions. At least one of our members and we didn't have very many <laughs> at that point. One of our members left the union because of our affiliation. Um, he was an African American uh, uh, graduate student, and he left. He he left because of the AFT backing of the of the um, Baki decision. Now, the organizing from the inside. I mean, that's a sort of a general principle. Um, that I think is widely recognized in social movements and union organizing uh, literature. Um, the the other issue, the you know, the, you know, or organizing versus something like a, a racial issue, something that we might talk about here because the, you know, that's resonant with a lot of stuff that's going on in organizing today. I mean, the, the wording today might be identity politics. Um, on the one hand, versus a, a class, class more class-oriented focus. On on the other hand, there was an article in the New York Times just a couple of year, a couple of weeks ago that phrased it exactly that that um, around the country there were these debates and discussions going on class versus identity politics. I'm not sure it's you know it's a an exact um, match up there, but um, something that we should talk about uh, could talk about. Um, the Baki decision, of course, is very much in play. If you follow uh, issues of affirmative action and challenges to affirmative action in higher education, I think the Baki decision is still one of the, um, you know, one of the foundational uh, legal cases uh, for that. So, um, right on time. Hey, okay. <laughs> All right. Pass it on. Drop the mic. No. <laughs> Do you want you want to go right to the grassroots? Okay. Sure. Uh, well, first, I, I'm Olivia Clark. Um, I just want to thank Bill for all of his work and leadership in the past and in the present. Thank you, Bill. Um, I want to thank Jerry, who really was a mentor for me in the sociology department, and I love listening to you. I hope you talk some more. I cede some time to you. Um, and I want to also call out Paul Fitzgerald in the audience, who was one of the early, um, very early organizers who sh should also be with us. And there's two people who aren't here that I want to uh, give a shout out to, and that's Bonnie Byron, who uh, was a member of the negotiating team, a sociology student. Some of you may remember her, the long blonde braids. Um, and um, she was fierce. And Carolyn Howe, who was also really active. I don't know, remember if Carolyn was on the negotiating team. But yeah, she, was, yeah. she was. If Bonnie and Carolyn were here, we would all be singing Union Made. You know, we, and maybe tonight we can sing some Solidarity Forever or something because they always had the guitar and we were always singing and um, having a really good time. Um, so I was an observer from the sociology department and I have to say it was painful. Oh, I mean, I don't know how people did it. The, the perseverance, the hard work, the moments of intellectual brilliance on the part of the team, the note passing, the funny pictures. Um, it was just really amazing to watch. And I don't know how they did it, because I didn't have that same kind of fortitude or perseverance or patience. And I still have a visceral reaction when I think of the uh, higher ed uh, negotiator, Bill Lemon. He was such a snake. Anyway. Um, <laughs> They're all snakes. They're it was re it, uh, really hard for me to think about that without sneering. Um, and I came, I came to the campus uh, without any uh, background in labor. I'd been a, a student activist on really women and maybe identity politics issues, as you um, framed it, uh, in my undergraduate career, and was um, really kind of mentored by a couple of uh, former SDS sociologists. So it's kind of how I ended up here. So I didn't have any history in labor, but I learned so much by attending and being active in the GTFF. Um, my fellow GTFF uh, members just demonstrated incredible hard work. 
Um, and I learned, I think, one of my takeaways from being a grassroots person and going on to do grassroots organizing was that um, social change really requires that kind of long-term commitment, that it's a lot of unsexy meeting, sitting, working, researching, hard work. It's not just marching around for a day. You know, it's not just, uh, you know, Occupy Wall Street for a day or a month or whatever. It's, it's much more difficult than that to make social change. And that was one of my um, takeaways, I think, as a grassroots person. I also learned, um, and, you know, Jerry, I think, would drag me to the Lane County Labor Council, um, was uh, that the, having a union, having the GTFF, having a contract, gave us a platform, gave us standing, gave us agency to join in coalitions with others, to actually influence uh, policy and other venues to, um, to work at the state level or, or larger local level. And I think that was really meaningful. And I took those lessons uh, with me um, in my career when I left uh, the academic world um, to get my hands dirty <laughs> out uh, organizing around affordable housing, farm worker housing, uh, whatever it was. Um, let's see, I did write some notes. Um, I went on to work locally as a neighborhood activist in Eugene, and then I worked statewide organizing a rural a low income housing coalition. And then when um, Reagan cut everything in those days, I had to take other part-time jobs and eventually became uh, working for local government, state government, and intergovernmental relations. Um, but I, I took all those lessons with me and got additional organizing training from the Midwest Academy, a lot of the old um, OEO types, uh, uh, Office of Economic Opportunity for um, people who are younger people. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm proud to say that uh, my younger brother and I are the first people to go to college in our family, let alone graduate school. You know, what's graduate school? Um, and then my brother went on to become sort of a left-wing small businessman um, in California and a real muckraker and bomb thrower. And actually, oh, I'm almost done, don't worry. Um, <laughs> uh, he, when I went to work for Governor Kitzhaber, he told me I had sold out. And <laughs> that I was now working for the man, and you know, and I thought, well, you know, we need good people everywhere, right? That's what I was told: is good people need to infiltrate everywhere. Um, but I really uh, built a lot of my career around the things that I learned from the GTF and learned from people like Bill and Jerry and that experience. So, enough of that. Enough of the grassroots. Well, I mean, like Olivia, I have to really thank Jerry. Uh, in terms of all kinds of different lessons. But uh, yeah, I had a union background. I belonged to the UAW when I was 19, 20 years old uh, the United Auto with the United Aircraft Workers uh, in Long Beach, California. So when Jerry approached a whole bunch of us to be members of the union, it was no doubt that that's what I was going to do as I would be a, a, a member of the union. But I think the takeaway uh, that I learned from Jerry uh, was that you had to have make alliances. The fact that you made alliances with the Teamsters, the fact you made alliances with all these other unions here in Eugene meant that we had power. And I think that's the unforgotten thing. We should never forget that when you're organized, you have power. And that scares the crap out of the other side, believe me. So my, I really what I want to kind of focus on is what, what is it that I learned? Because I eventually uh, got a job working at Pittsburgh State University in Kansas. Um, folks, Kansas is a right-to-work state. Uh, and I'm just saying it, yes, uh, that makes a big difference. Um, you know, you have this, well, this decision that was made uh, in terms of employees in the United States. Uh, all I can say is that it's just going to take more effort to organize, all right? Because believe me, uh, spending 31 years and three times as a president and being called uh, a terrorist, a thug, because we were standing up t for our rights, uh, that takes it. That takes its toll, all right? So I guess the practice of unions, especially trying to organize college professors, one of the things that I kind of understood as a consequence of being a member of this union and being a member of um, 
the uh, UAW is that most professors are, are, are there. It's unsocialized labor. All right. And so what you get when, in fact, when you go out and recruit, you have to not ever give up. We here where I taught for 30 years, uh, we always wrote a letter to the new faculty who were going to come on board. You're, and even in the interview process, by the way, we would just let them know this is a union campus. And if you want to come here to work, uh, this is how it's going to be. Um, and what I've kind of found out is that those folks whose fathers or mothers were in unions, there was any problem. But you're going to see um, that those middle class students, even if they're progressives and they're, you know, radicals and Marxists, they still kind of believe, quite frankly, that unions are only there to help out people who are problems, right? And, uh, and so that's sort of the things that we confronted uh, as being a, a union person in a right-to-work state uh, at Pittsburgh State University. Also, the other thing, I, I, we were, I was talking to some other folks this last few days about the problems we face in Kansas. Um, the legislature two or three years ago took away tenure for K to 12 teachers. And so the chorus that, that resonated with the people who were in higher education that that might happen to us. Um, what our union serve director, that would be Mike's position here, what he had to do is go around and renegotiate all the contracts where they would have at least due process, okay? Um, now, one of the things that I have observed, and I think Jerry and I were talking about this yesterday, is that GTFF is a very important socialization process. Because once you leave here, especially you sociology folks, <laughs> you leave with certain skills, all right? And those skills are useful in terms of doing your union work. The one that I use the most was surveys in my position as president. And there's nothing like coming to the table <laughs> and negotiating a contract when you have data. Because they can't, and, and the other side, there's, I'm going to say this, they're so freaking arrogant. <laughs> they just can't just take the idea that you know, the faculty uh, are displeased with certain things. We should be happy. We're all big one family. You didn't know that? We're one big happy family here. And so, again, um, the other thing that I think do um, you have to kind of recognize, too, is if you're in leadership positions, and, that course, as GTFF and uh, the fact that you're going to go off to another university where you might be in a union, and you're going to occupy these uh, leadership positions, you have to keep your ear to the ground. You have to be 24 hours a day listening to what's going on in the legislature, what's going on in campus. And I think what you're going to find out is that what the union provides is that it provides you, to, it provides you that opportunity to offset this unsocialized part of, of labor that you're going to start meeting people from all over the campus. And that is a way of really kind of seeing uh, and understanding um, how you're going to recruit more members, all right? Um, so th that's sort of my takeaway. My takeaway is that once you are, are in the union and you got the experience of being in the union, you leave, you leave Oregon here and you go off into your profession, um, you're going to realize that um, that you're going to need to use your skills and, and so on. So I hand it over to Steve. Is, is this, let's see if this one works. Um, okay. Uh, so thanks to everybody and, and particularly to Bill and Jerry and the people who organized this. Um, they've been talking to me about it for years and I didn't do much. Uh, except say I'd be glad to participate if you guys organize it, uh, and they did. Uh, so I was part of the negotiating team that met with the university for the first contract. I'd been involved a little bit in the in the organizing foundation, but not very much, particularly compared to the work that Jerry and others did and Paul. Uh, but 
uh, some of us inside sociology had started a research institute. University didn't particularly like that either, by the way, although they did give us the smallest amount of, of space for it. Uh, and I had developed a little bit of a reputation, I guess, for being pretty good at finding out facts, and I'm pretty quick with numbers and statistics. So they thought they needed someone who could do that. Uh, that turned out to be almost a useless skill. Um, and so when I think about it, my main memory of this is the tedious, incredibly long negotiating meetings. And you might think a negotiating meeting would be people on two sides of a table talking back and forth. Oh, no. It's you present a proposal, usually written, and then they ask for a half-hour recess while they think about it. And then they come back and they give you a response that isn't particularly germane to the proposal. So you ask them something else and they ask for another half an hour recess, think about it some more. And, uh, or they say, well, or, or you say something to them and they sit there. And they don't really say anything back for quite a while. Um, it's kind of unnerving the first time it happens, but you get used to it. And so we had meetings that would sometimes start early evening and end up at 11 or 12 o'clock at night after four or five hours during which time very few words would be exchanged, a few pieces of paper, a lot of notes between us, um, and, 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 so, and so it would go. Um, and I actually felt that, in, that the negotiating team from the university really had no authority of their own. They couldn't decide, oh, we're going to give you this or ask them for health insurance. They're not going to say sure and sign off. They'd be fired tomorrow, and the university would deny it. So they really couldn't do anything. They were there primarily to stall us, to wear us down. I mean, eventually, we, some of us might even like graduate and go away if they could make it last long enough. So uh, it was only when we got to where we, 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 where we started to, to suggest that we would strike. And even then, that in and of itself was not so much force until we got other unions to agree that they would honor such a strike. And so when the university realizes that all deliveries from the Teamsters will be cut off, and that other, other unionized employees will not come to work. That really, that the, that the picket line would actually have power on campus. Um, we had rules that were so ultra-democratic that we failed a couple times on strike votes. Any normal union rule we would have passed, which would have been 50% of those who show up at a meeting vote, and that's it. That's the more standard thing. We had like two-thirds of all members. Couldn't get two-thirds of all members to ever vote, let alone vote for any one thing. So, but the fact that we could redo those rules and eventually reach a strike did bother them quite a bit. And they, they realized this would first not play well in the press and it would cause them trouble. Also, we were on firm legal ground in terms of hours, wages, working conditions, stuff that we were asking for. We also fought mightily to try and get health insurance, which we did not get in that first contract. It was probably in some ways the thing we wanted the most that we couldn't get. But it did lay the groundwork for subsequent contracts that did get health insurance. And it did the most important thing was to have a contract, much as other speakers have said. Once you're in the situation where now you're recognized as an organization that can negotiate, that will in the end have a contract, and that you have the voice of labor behind you, it's amazingly powerful. And so getting that any contract at all was a huge victory, I felt. Uh, so I came out of it, uh, one, uh, able to take more tedium than I realized, <laughs> much better at sitting still, and uh, with, with you know, pride that we had succeeded at this. Uh, personally, of course, no benefit whatsoever from my current situation or anybody else's, really, in terms of how much money you were going to get or health insurance or anything, but it laid the groundwork for a much better situation, well worth the effort. In terms of life lessons, I got a few important things out of it, I think. Uh, first, I did go on to organize campaign, political campaigns. Uh, those, anyone here who's a Eugene person, and there aren't many of us, might remember the Nuclear Free Zone campaign. I was the chief petitioner and organizer of that, uh, which we lost but won a great battle. I thought it was the most expensive political campaign in Eugene history, and it really changed people's understanding and attitudes towards nuclear weapons in Eugene. And the toxic right to no law, I was also the chief petitioner for that and changed the charter of the city so that companies in Eugene that use toxic materials have to report those, and we have that still goes on today. It's almost the only source of information like that in the entire world. A very valuable and cool thing. You can get it on the library website if you want. Um, also learn, in a personal sense, if you're negotiating with somebody for something, first, never take their first offer. That'd be ridiculous. <laughs> Don't take their third offer. Um, 
And don't be afraid to propose a very low counteroffer of any sort. Um, I have a friend who recently bought some land from a mining company in Montana that they'd quit mining, and he's going to make kind of a reserve out of it. They wanted $150,000. He paid 20000 in the end because it turned out they had enormous costs of just holding this land, and it wasn't worth anything. And he started when they asked for 100, offered 150 He said, how about 10000 And they eventually settled on twenty. So you just never know. And don't be afraid not to say anything in response to an offer. You don't have to say anything. Don't say anything for quite a while, and the other person will give you another offer long before you get tired of not saying anything. Now, if you use these tactics in your personal life, you'll have no friends, you'll get a divorce, <laughs> everybody will know you're a complete asshole, and, and your life will go to hell. But if you can parse it out and use them in the right, in, in the right spot, then it's an extremely useful skill to have. And it also lets you know that hard battles can be won. So I, I think it was a fabulous experience. I think of it frequently, usually with chagrin at sitting in that little room, but also with great pride that we accomplished it. So thanks again. Uh, well, I'll thank you. I want to just thank everyone for, for coming, for inviting me. Uh, and I apologize for David. I, uh, you will miss David's voice. He has probably one of the most distinctive uh, and wonderful voices you can imagine, low and gravelly, which is not my voice. Uh, and so uh, I will do the best I can filling in for, you know, for David. I guess I, wanted to, I have an odd role in this in that I, um, I've been in Eugene twice now. <laughs> All right, once in 1977 for... I seem to remember two days. Bill says it's a week. David says it's two weeks. So you can figure out how long I was here the first time. Um, and, and, now, and now for the, this, the couple of days. I think what I want to talk about, and I think it's probably useful, a little bit about the history of the TA Union before uh, 1977, all right, when we came out here. The TA Union was, found, was created in 1969. All right, which was a very, t so I guess there's enough gray here so you for everybody to know what that was in terms of the, the anti-war movement, especially in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, and what prompted the union was the elimination of freshman English. Some of the people who are younger here de have never s experienced freshman English. Uh, <laughs> yes, all the old folks here remember, remember it a lot. And of course, the university eliminated it because it was a, they, were, they required lots of teaching assistants, um, and they were the most political, the active. Uh, and so they wanted to eliminate a lot of act student activism uh, and support for any kind of organization. Uh, and that was a major, major change in how the university, what the university did, how it viewed its educational role. Uh, and you know, there were many other things. Obviously, you had the anti-war movement. You had lots of other act activism. Um, and I'm not going to go through, I, I actually got to Madison in 1973. Um, and at that point, uh, since I only have five minutes, I'm just leaping over several things. Um, the, the, one of the things with TA unions, I mean, we found this, we, I was involved in a number of, you know, uh, supporting campaigns beyond, you know, in Eugene, there was in Connecticut, there was Michigan, uh, the ones I remember anyway. Uh, but one of the problems is that you have lots of transition. People do leave. They graduate. Uh, and by 73, the TA union realized that it was, it was a serious problem. How do you, the university will outlast you. They have far more institutional stability. Uh, and that's why, uh, even in light of the kind of problems that Jerry talked about with the AFT, uh, we affiliated with the AFT in 1973. David and I were the first, among the first uh, representatives from the, you know, the, the TA Union to the Central Labor Council. Uh, and we'll just say we were not welcomed with open arms. Uh, and we were obviously, we were, you know, they were very conservative, mostly the building trades. Uh, we were also the largest local in the Wisconsin Federation of Teachers. Uh, we had, they initially gave us a full vote for every member and so we basically took over the Wisconsin Federation of Teachers for a year. 
uh, until they then decided you're not full time and cut us down to half so we didn't have as many, as many votes. Uh, and so I think, you know, but that's, but also that gave us um, the institutional ability to survive. And much like, you know, it was described here, having that support from other unions. Uh, that, you know, that, and that's why we also went out to speak to many places. We said, look, this does, this does work. Now, I have a, my, I was in the chemistry and, the, you know, unlike here, that was not, there were not a lot of chemistry folks in the, the, the union. In fact, there was one. Uh, and that he was the president of the union did not sit well with the, with the faculty. Uh, and so, but it was still, and in fact, being president of the union was the only reason I survived in graduate school. Because uh, <laughs> uh, it would have been a, messy if they had gotten rid of me too easily. Uh, but it also, you know, talked about, uh, you know, from the university, we had the AFT affiliation. Uh, we were able to, you know, you know, there were, and I, there's, there's many, many years of history with the state, you know, basically not, you know, passing legislation to, to try and, you know, make it impossible for TAs to have graduate students to form a union. Uh, but in those days, those early years, that established us as a force within the state, within the legislature, within the campus, on how to deal with a broad range of issues. Uh, and in fact, one of the strengths of the union was that we did deal with a broad range of issues, on issues of what kind of classes. Uh, and it's also brought people together. I mean, David is, uh, I was in chemistry, to take David as an example, he was in French political history. Uh, and let's be honest, I would never <laughs> have met anybody in French political history <laughs> without the Union. Uh, as fascinating as this, <laughs> and two minutes, well. Uh, and I've always been good with numbers, so I can figure that out. Uh, but it was also, you know, uh, that's when that's, more than anything is what unions do. Um, I've been involved in lots of other, you know, union organizing campaigns. Uh, and if you go back far enough in like, you know, we talked about, people talk about Millgate communities, all right, in essence, that people lived close to where they work. In fact, even until the 70s, you had, for all the, all right, people still live much closer to where they work, which is not the case now. But what unions do is bring people together, all right? Uh, as far apart as chemistry and French political history, all right, they are, or the German department was very strong at that time. I have no idea why, but that's, uh, well, some people, David had some yeah, ideas. Uh, but I think the point is that that's what that, the TA unions did, and across, across the country, it changed, as the universities changed, as the political climate changed. And by the 1977, when the, the GTFF was forming, uh, the political time it had was very different than it was in 1969. Uh, universities were changing, the funding was changing, the emphasis. It was no longer eliminating freshman English, uh, which, you know, which was a very different thing of what the university was supposed to do. And as the university's function changed, there's a need for those kinds of organization between time. And I will end there. There's no wire. Um, again, I'm Jeff Edmondson. Uh, I was in the second wave, essentially. Most of these folks kind of first wave. I was in the second wave. I arrived here in, in summer of 77. Uh, got recruited at registration and it was one of those, you got a union? Wow. Uh, and I was hooked pretty much immediately um, and became active pretty, pretty rapidly at that point. Um, ended up on the bargaining team with the other folks and as it's, it, it emphasized, it echo the tediousness, <laughs> as Steve said. But did get some paper grading done, you know, studying done in between and there's, and there's off times. That's, yeah. Um, I want to speak a little about the strike vote. This hadn't been talked about too much else because we held the, the two strike votes that both had failed and that point was sort of, I so had no choice but to go into the university and take take whatever the last offer was, more or less. I and mean, I think there was there was value in it, as, as was mentioned. But um, one of the things that I learned later 
in, in my union work was, was that, well, essentially we had, we had poor staff advice. The AFT staff we had at the time was pretty, was pretty rudimentary, I guess I would say. Uh, and we had pretty bad advice because what, you, what I came to understand later was you don't hold a strike vote until you know what the result's going to be. You, know, um, you don't, um, and that's sort, of, that's sort of basic knowledge now, but we didn't know it then. Uh, that you, you, know, you do a survey, you make sure you know where the votes are before you actually hold the vote. Um, we, didn't, we didn't know it then. We didn't, again, we didn't have the advice to understand that, being, being new to it. So um, um, it was unfortunate, but that ended up being the reality. I think, I think uh, contrast with before, I think we, you needed to have at least two-thirds. You don't, you don't go on strike unless you have three-quarters or more. Otherwise, it's kind of pointless. You can't go with a majority or a small majority. Um, Nonetheless, so we, we took what we got. There, the, change, the change I want to argue that we got that was in the first contract that was most significant was the workload limitation. Um, you know, people were widely abused across the university in terms of what they were asked to do uh, for, for the minimal pay that we got. Uh, and the workload language forced some, some serious conversations in departments about, about how much people were expected to do. And it got a lot of people, as I understood, at least raises from, you know, from a 0.25 or 0.3 to a 0.45. So they got significant raises if they were teaching a full class to try to get some, some kind of equity. So I thought there were some significant changes. And the university really didn't like that. Neither did the faculty. Um, faculty in my department, I don't know how this is replicated in other departments, in my department in psych, um, really pissed off about the workload limitations and being, being able to sort of work people as they wanted. Um, and, you know, they came, after, they came after me as a result, came after me uh, you know, on the academic side. And, you know, I filed a grievance, actually filed and won one of, the, one of the first grievances we had and won a grievance when they were trying to kick me out uh, early on. Um, and I, I, I see that as, as largely being due to the, to the activism and particularly the activism around, around workload. I was sort of the one in the department pushing them to, to try to enforce a contract. So we had to do sort of department by department because the university wasn't pushing them all that hard to enforce the contract. We had to do it sort of within within the departments. Um, but I think that, you know, that there was, it was a long, it was a struggle, and it, just, it wasn't something that was solved then, or even, I was talking to people today, there's still issues, <laughs> workload issues today. Uh, those things always come around, but I, but I th think it was the one that, it, that perhaps had the most immediate change, but it took time, again, to struggle out um, in uh, department by department. Um, another key uh, was institutionalizing the union. I think this, you know, this is, everybody know, here knows that there was a u unique situation here where you have so much turnover, you always have to sort of rebuild the union. Uh, um, but that became one of my f real focuses, I think, the, as, as vice president and then ultimately as the first staff person was to sort of continue trying to build an institutionalization, trying to get a solid department rep in every department. So I spent a lot of time going out to departments and building that uh, the structure. You know, I think the, the energy, the energy it takes to, to organize and, and win the election is one thing, is that, you know, the long-term energy to, to build the institution was another. Um, and, and I think it's part of why we set, decided ultimately we needed a staff because uh, the, you know, the, ultimately the, the volunteer energy was beginning to, to wane a little bit after, or after time by, by, this is by early 1980. Um, and so you sort of need somebody there who was, who was gonna be there doing the work full time and getting, getting out the departments, maintaining contact in departments. So uh, we did that and obviously it's been, it's been something that the GTFF has had to do ever since and obviously has done successfully hence 40 years of success. Um, let me sp then speak to the second contract. So I was the chief spokesperson for the second contract. And I think, again, workload was one of the critical issues there. The university came back realizing that the workload limitations we put in had really hamstrung their ability to exploit people. And so they came back determined to change the language. And that was, to my recollection, okay, the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest sort of bone of contention in that second round of negotiations. Uh, and we had, you know, we, we spent, and, and part of the issue with the second contract negotiation is we starting, starting like three or four months after the first contract was signed, uh, we had to start writing on the next contract because this is the first one had taken so long. So we struggled over that. We struggled internally. We had, you know, we had an internal struggle over how much to concede on workload or other issues, um, but we ultimately worked those out, made some concessions. We, you know, we, I think because the experience before decided we didn't have the, uh, didn't have the, um, for the support to go for a strike vote, having, having had that experience just a year before. So by the fall of 79, you know, just a year later, we, you know, we didn't go for a strike vote. We, we first rejected fact finders report and then, um, and then negotiated on and t basically to get what we could get um, without threatening strike. Uh, and we, we, and I think we settled on something, I think some of us are concerned that the workload language we settled on would blow a hole in it. I think it didn't, from my recollection, it still became something that was enforceable and made a difference in people's lives. Uh, um, but uh, it, it became, yeah, it was, 
It was, it was an easier second contract because we knew some of the ropes, um, harder because the university was sort of determined to, to do some take back. So most of the stuff, I, I guess the one thing I had mentioned just in reference to AFT, somebody brought the you know, AFT uh, and, and Al, in the era of Al Shanker. Uh, those of us who went to AFT conventions, uh, it, was, it was literally a surreal experience. You try to get something voted on, it would pass, and then they realized they hadn't, and then they realized they hadn't given the command to the majority how they were supposed to vote, and then they would re call a revote on it and, and, and reject what we had just passed. Um, it, was a, it was a very surreal, because they had complete control, Shanker had complete control of the convention. Uh, and that surreal experience was uh, pretty frustrating. Um, but we can talk about that some other time. Okay. Thank you very much again for panelists. Uh, they came from, far, from Eugene, they came from the, Portland, they came from Massachusetts, from Kansas, uh, and from, Wisconsin, uh, from Chicago. And uh, I think we benefited a lot from these observations. It had to be quick. We have a tight uh, schedule. But uh, again, thanks, thanks very much for this. And this should set us off on uh, some discussion. We don't have as much time if we stick to our schedule as we'd hoped. Uh, coffee break is uh, officially at uh, 1045. But I want to uh, op open the floor now for questions and answers. Uh, from the panelists. You can direct them to the panelists directly or just in general, and we'll ask one or two to respond, or some discussion. But please keep your remarks, if you can, brief. Uh, I'd like particularly to invite uh, the GTFF members from those early years who are here, uh, Lee Bradford Rattery in the first row, Michael Bischel in the second row, uh, Paul Fitzgerald in the third row, and Linda Peterson, uh, Marv, and Artie Dunn, who uh, preceded the GTFF but were uh, G uh, sociology uh, GTFs uh, at the time. Uh, 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 Sylvia Hart Landsberg, one of the original members and also in, heavily involved in the negotiations, and, and uh, Marty Hart Landsberg, who went on to a uh, professional career as, uh, as a professor, uh, 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 finishing at Lewis and Clark. Um, and uh, there are people, uh, if I'm recognizing, and in the back, there's Margaret Halleck, who was an encouraging facu young faculty member at the time. Uh, who went on to do a brilliant career as uh, director, notably of the Labor Education Research Center and Wayne Morris uh, Center also. Uh, we have some activists from Eugene, and, and if they have some thoughts on that, uh, Kurt Wilcox, who was at our rally and, and dinner last night, a uh, longtime union activist, uh, beside him, Michael Goldstein, who, in, uh, invite, who helped us with some uh, legal advice in the initial stages. Herb Everett, who was a longtime activist for Eugene Friends of the Farm Workers. And as Steve said, there was an important campaign for a nuclear-free zone. I still have Herb's poster uh, on my wall. And uh, he made important contributions. I don't want to uh, to have just the, those people speak or question. I'd like very much anybody who would like to get on the floor and ask questions or have some discussion to do so, but particularly invite them if they have some comments uh, since they weren't on the panel and they made uh, important contributions at the time. If you do have a question or a comment to make, please uh, just identify yourself, uh, what you do, what you did then, what you do now, uh, and uh, away we go. Floor is open. I'll start out. Um, I was thinking about just institutionalizing union in the campus, but I'm thinking about institutionalizing the concept of organizing in yourself. And what I've noticed in my career is you think that this organizing that you are learning about and all of these Mr. Lemon strategies that make you crazy, uh, this is now. But it continues again and again and again and again in your life. Mm -hmm. If you're going to stand up for what's right mm -hmm. for yourself or anybody else, you're going to run into these things again. And every time you get smarter and you see it farther on the horizon and even before they know what they're doing, you know what they're doing. And you can prepare way better every single time you have another wave of this, you know, oh my God, here we go again. Uh, but it institutionalizes the idea of social support and organizing. Um, I worked on a ballot measure to limit prisons. There were five of us to start. Which didn't throw me at all because GTFF had, I don't know, six, eight, however many we were. Um, and so having five people that were saying no prison expansion didn't throw me. 
we printed out a bunch of flyers and went to open house at the prison and then we were off and running and the next thing you know the Portland papers were saying there was a movement in Eugene <laughs> and we looked at each other and said we're a movement wow <laughs> this is cool but it just goes on and it's and and I did lots of grievance and watching out for people who were in trouble mm -hmm. in public sector <coughs> was a consultant doing organization development looking for trouble and trying to solve it and so it's a life path for as you have noticed a lot of us didn't just stop thank you yes. good point yeah. questions comments yes yeah, please. I, I, I just like to say that you've talked about the history and Mike, what Michael's comment is, it's a lifelong process. We go back to people that we have met and known and you young people who are here are going to look at us all gray hairs and you're going to go, oh my God, it is a process. We made it. And you're going to teach the next generation. So I would just like to acknowledge the contribution that Professor Al Shemansky made. Uh -huh. Especially in the sociology. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Big yeah. um, Professor Shemansky uh, unfortunately took his own life uh, in the 1980s, but he was a, a, a rock in sociology and on campus uh, while he was a professor. And yes, thank you for. You know. Harry? I would just like to add that to the younger GTFs who are going to go on to their professional careers. It's never going to be a smooth process. I mean, all of us have wounds. To get back to Michael's point, that um, when you when you have a contract, and I think Steve and the rest of them mentioned this, now you have to have them conform to that contract, comply that contract. And I think I made this point to you guys yesterday. That means that you're going to have to be willing to step up to the plate and file grievances. Um, anybody who's gone through the tenure and promotion process, you understand that they have to, if it's in the contract, and they don't want to follow the contract in terms of they want to go after you because they don't like you or because of your ethnicity or because of your politics in my case, right? Um, you, have a pro you have a means by which you can, I mean, I don't know how many times they try to fire me, but they were never successful. You weren't counting. Yeah, well, that's like Michael says. I mean, you went through it. You know what the game is. Um, and, you know, at the first time, maybe you didn't sleep for a week. But after that, you know, you kind of figure out. Um, they gave up with me. They just gave up. Um, but you understand, when you have a union, guess who's there to help you? Guess who your friends are? You're not alone. Like with some people who just like, you know, I, I know folks that, they weren't in the union, they hated the union. Um, whatever they did, they pissed off the chair for whatever reason, and they're gone. <coughs> but if you have a union, and you have a grievance process, and you have a faculty that is going to hear the final, like in our grievance process, we had a faculty that listened to the final argument, all right? And they go, they knew by this time, institutionally, that the other side was just lying. And do they lie? Jeff, do they lie? <laughs> Steve, do they lie? Never. Never. They are, oh, they're it just like they're experts at this lie and stuff, you know? You know, it's not, you know, so um, the, the, idea, the idea of having a union is so important um, in terms of your own professional career and being able to kind of stand up and, and stand up for your rights. I mean, yesterday, you guys were talking about, I'm a human being. Well, they don't think you are. <laughs> You're there. To, they're, they're, a lot of these institutions these days, they're looking at the numbers. They, all they're looking at is the head count. And, you know, it, if you have five students in your class, they might just cancel your class and they might take away your position. So that's my take on what, off what Michael said that. Every time you get into a, a struggle, you, you know, the next time it's going to be just that much easier. Thank you, Harry. 
Other comments, questions, answers? Sylvia, please. I just want to underscore a topic that came up wisely, and that is the socialization. And Harry, I think you had a good term for it, but it was about socializing labor. Right. Because in my modest organizing for the union, um, that, that I needed to be socialized, and Jerry was my leader and held my hand in that. And I needed to be encouraged to feel like I really, my lack of knowledge was not necessarily a, a problem. Mm -hmm. And I feel that uh, working um, to talk to people educated me. I am going to get to so beyond my own socialization in a minute. Um, and like facing the genteel, sort of white master attitude of some of the members of my department to yeah. talk with them helped me. It was very ironic in the anthropology department, but I think that would be quite true in many other departments that people felt they were above union membership and allegiance. Mm -hmm. So that not only socialized me, but um, it made me realize how, how narrow our education <coughs> system is. And now, this is more of the topic I'd like to raise as the problem, more of that is on the unions than ever before to teach people about union, about union. The schools don't do it, the union members aren't there or aren't doing it. And so it's up to unions to lead people very broadly, and I don't know how, but it's going to take very, very wide net to, like Jerry cast a wide net in recruiting me, and wider nets and PR and all the modern means of bringing people into awareness of you, so there's no one else to do it. What department were you in? Anthropology. Yeah, sorry, I didn't say that. Yeah, so I was talking to people who were, who imagined themselves to be very interested in society. <laughs> yeah, I've been right. Very interested. Very, very ignorant. And that's worse today as everyone is going on. Yeah, you can have the people who are the most to the left Marxists and they won't join because they think they're above it all mm -hmm. until something personally happens to them. Right. And uh, I, it's been my experience too often to, I, we had one guy who is probably going to be, he is an, a permanent assistant professor, uh, and he just criticized the hell everybody because he, you know, he was going to be the teacher. Well, until the, we got a new chair, <laughs> and she just said, you know, I'm coming after you. And guess what, after what, almost 25 years, he finally joined the union. Thank you. Finally did joined you, the union. I said, did you have anything now else we to can to promote him. Oh, we should well, promote him now. No, quickly. I'm just, I'm just trying to say right. it's not just socialization of the people who will be your organizers. It's socialization yeah. that there is such a thing as organizers. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you. You would think that an anthropologist would understand. Harry, I'm going to have to cut you off here. <laughs> okay. I see Michael. 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 Martian. I would love to hear just a little bit about actually how like concretely, how did you go from a couple of people saying we need a union to, to getting sitting down at the table with this university? Could you talk about like how you organized? Right. I'd like Jerry to respond to that and maybe uh, Steve, uh, no, no, Jerry. if he wants. Jerry. Jerry or Paul? Jerry. <laughs> Paul, get up here. <laughs> well, I was in the union office yesterday and uh, I, think, I think Harry uh, pointed to the to the board that you had what people's names on the board and then a it was like a, a, stewards, it's a stewards list okay an, an old-fashioned spreadsheet <laughs> hand handwritten um, and and Harry and I said we did that uh, in the very first union office and we had a, a big uh, sheet of paper and we had department by department and the name of every GTF in every department. And then uh, so, uh, so we tried to have a, 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 a leader uh, in each department. And their, their mission was to talk to everybody in the department and, um, and, 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 and you know, find out what their issues were, talk to them about how the union might, might relate to that. But here's a better answer to, to all this. Um, 
how do you go about or organizing? Too often we begin with the assumption that people aren't already organized and they need to be organized. College campuses are among the most highly organized places in America. The, uh, we're, students are organized, <laughs> right? It's just that they're organized by somebody else for some other purpose. So I think one of the keys to, or I hope this isn't too abstract, but one of the keys is to take advantage of the organization that is already there, you see. And the, and the department by department way of doing it is, is one way of doing that, right? You organize them within their department around the issues that are uh, there in, in that department. So the issues in the biology department are gonna be very different than the issues in, in sociology. And you take advantage of what is already there in that department. So most departments, even at that time, there was some sort of graduate student participation in even admissions decisions and, and things like that. So you can, you can I don't know, co-opt, right? You can, you, can, uh, you can take advantage of that. That's probably not a very good answer to your question, but. <laughs> right, but you didn't get into the back room of the office where we have the entire union charted on the wall. Oh. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be sick of information. <laughs> Blood type, social security number. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Time is running against us. I'm advised we should move to coffee. So coffee is just next door, and I understand uh, from uh, Jessica that we can just walk through this, uh, this door back here and, and proceed to coffee. You have about 15 minutes, and then we'll start into our next panel. And we may have more time to come back to, quest to unanswered questions to the first panel afterwards. Thank you very much. <laughs>